All right. Welcome, Sea Bay Soldiers, Silurians, Sea Devils, and Runner Up for Worst Costume Ever to episode 313 of an Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 17th of July, 2019, and featuring Warriors of the Deep, written by Johnny Byrne, and starring Peter Davison as the Doctor, Janet Fielding as Tegan Jovanka, and Mark Strickson as Fizzler Turlow. I am Bill Sylvia, the Man in Black, and I'm waiting to see what other, what my next uh, piece of hardware failure is going to be. With me are Randy Ronson McCulloch. Can somebody stop the heat, please? I'd like to get off. Mad Matt Winchell. It's all melting. Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. Heat wave. And Thomas Fireheart. It's lizard people and there's no Malcolm Holt. That's a bit sad. <laughs> that is true. Richard, he would have been dead by then, but probably, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. Oh. Could have done a dedication. <laughs> but, oh, geez. It, I mean, if it, I was his family, would have felt insulted to have this, <laughs> this have a dedication to me. <laughs> it is freaking hot outside. Mm. The high tomorrow is 92 degrees. Mm. And that's after the, a supposed rainstorm this oof. evening. Yep. The high the day after, 97 degrees. I know and my... This, uh... is, this is before heat mm. index, people. Mm -hmm. he... uh, my... My cousin in Jersey was talking about 100 plus degrees uh, down there. Yeah, the heat index is going to make it 100 yeah. plus. Now, How you do you access the heat index? Because all I see is the temperature that the Weather Channel app shows me, and that it doesn't include humidity yeah. or anything. Um, I usually go to AccuWeather, and they what they the heat index is what they call real feel. Okay. Um, because um, uh, in winter time you don't deal with heat index; you deal with wind chill. And, but, and the Weather Channel app shows wind chill, but it yeah. does, doesn't show heat index. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, actually, Weather Channel does show feels like. At the moment. In the winter. At the I've moment, never, it's yeah. 79 with a real feel of 86 mm. outside. And this is freaking, you know, 1045 at night. Normally, you know, by this time of night, the... Uh, temperature is the temperature and humidity is down so you don't get a heat index not yeah. this week yeah, yeah normally this by this week. point we're like came back down to the 70s yeah, yeah. Well, i'm looking up new york it's 73 degrees barometer 29.93 inches and humidity at 100 percent i have new york on mine too really temperature 74 real feel 76 i would have looked it up but discord probably would have frozen up on me <laughs> it's also it's also raining in New York apparently. Yes, it's, it is. It has not been raining as much today as I, as the weather uh, forecast led me to expect. But it has been raining. Oh, I will add this to the weather as well. The last couple of days, I've been mowing the lawn. Mm. <laughs> Let me put it to you this way: I've not seen these wet spots on my shirts before. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah. God. So, uh, a little other piece of news over the week. I got a new mattress. Mm, yeah. Um, so we moved my old mattress, aka Mr. Blobby. <laughs> Blobby, oh Mr. Blobby. Anyway, did you need to wear safety gloves to move it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a bit of a nightmare to get it down to where we're, uh, they have the mattresses stored to go out on Thursday. Um, because it is pretty much an amorphous flop blob. <laughs> I had to take, uh, I had to take the arm strap off of one of my laptop bags and use it as a makeshift bungee cord. Oh, I told, I told Aaron, we should have got the handyman secret weapon duct tape. I could have just duct taped the mattress into a large medicine ball. Just burn it. Uh, yeah, I wish the city would let us. Um, but when we peeled the mattress off of the old box spring, the old box spring looked like one of those bed of nails you see from India. Ooh. With all the things going up. It's like, because Aaron was originally like, yeah, we can just take it off and put the mattress on the old box spring until you get a new one. And then she looked at it and went, oh, my God. No, we're getting you a new box spring right now. <laughs> 
We're, yeah. we're spending the extra money on the box spring now. Never mind. Because otherwise, okay. that thing will ruin the mattress. In like 24 was, hours, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, we got the new box spring. It came in a box about half the size that you would expect the new upright vacuum cleaner to come in. Hmm. I'm like, what the shit? It was an assemble yourself box spring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the hell? I didn't know Ikea made box springs. <laughs> He's about to say. It's just kind of what it felt like. Um, but I managed to put it together. And it was all it's all metal as opposed to having a wooden frame. So hopefully that'll hold up a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, my box spring does not contain any springs. Eyebrow raised. Huh. But it came in a box. So mm -hmm. it's halfway. It's it's interesting, and I'm I'm still getting used to it. It's causing me some back pain at the moment, because my back is like, hey, hey, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> hey, hey, we actually have back support on this thing. What's this? This is madness. Yeah, this is this is this is insane. This is insanity. Ow! So I get up every morning, and I sit up, and I just go, oh, oh, and get my way to the bathroom, and then get my way into the kitchen for my toaster scrambles. And then <coughs> get my way back to bed for a couple hours. If I had toaster strudel again for the first time in about a year, I miss them. I've discovered toaster scrambles. They recently added potato to them. They they actually heat better than they used to. Hmm. And two toaster scrambles is about 750 milligrams of sodium, which puts it right in my breakfast lo level. Hmm. Yay. So that's uh, so a couple of that and a thing of applesauce, and I'm good. Um, anyway, enough with about heat and beds. On heat tonight's beds show, we have news and birthdays, and not a lot of either. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Geek talk, we have plenty of, but a lot of it's old school. Mm. Um, a lot, but not all. I take it you didn't see last week's episode, Tim? Uh, I did see, managed to catch, watch last few episodes this weekend, if you want me to do a review of Shane. That would be good. Yes, right. we, we need you to get cut, caught up. <laughs> okay. We, and we then, of course, our episode summary, our review, our final thoughts, and our ratings. Okay. So, let's jump into birthdays, of which there are two. All right, uh, let me swap over here. <laughs> the first birthday is the 11th of July... And is David Graham, who was one of the original Dalek voices from 1963 to 1965. Uh, he was through Dalek Master Plan. Mm. <clears throat> and he turned uh, 94 and is actually still kicking. Oh, wow. That makes him officially the oldest Dalek. The second is the 15th of July and is Angus McKay who played Cardinal Barusa in The Deadly Assassin on this list, of course, because Bar Cardinal Barusa had a few regenerations mm -hmm. and thus is counted as a, few, as, a, as a repeat person. In fact, every time Barusa showed up, he was played by a new actor. Yep. <laughs> he would have been 93, but died in 2013 at the age of 86. Angus McKay knew that immortality was a curse, not a blessing. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, the one from that and the Invasion of Time were like the smart Barusas. Then he regenerated and got dumb. Yep, sadly. <laughs> he, he was far more interesting when he was a good guy. Yes, he was. He was a, he was a much better character instead of being the generic president of, of corruption. Mm-hmm. Because I kind of liked him because he was the one Time Lord that wasn't corrupt. He wasn't completely corrupt, and he actually kind of saw the Doctor as something that was good and not completely mm -hmm, not useless. Not completely <laughs> useless. And then the second he became president, he turned into a dick. Of course, you know, that just might be a side effect of being president of Gallifrey. Ramana as, Ramana as president's a bit of a dick sometimes, too. Um, and, of course, Rassilon's a complete and total ass. Well, that's Rassilon <laughs> for you. The man who set up a trap to imprison people in stone. So, I don't know. There just might be a curse on the presidency. Even the doctor, yes. when he was president, was a bit of a dick. 
<laughs> when he wasn't running away from the post. <laughs> well, no, no. The invasion mm. of time, if you take a look at the mm. invasion of time, he was a dick for most of yep. it. And then you take a look at his brief his brief orders as president at the end of the five doctors, he basically becomes a dick and then <laughs> escapes in the TARDIS. Uh, I think there's just a curse on the position. You become president of Gallifrey, you become a dick. And instead of becoming the permanent dick, the doctor would just there uh, be a dick for a moment and then bye. <laughs> That's right. Didn't the ele- uh, 12th Doctor become president again? Uh, yeah, and he became a dick. No, no, no. He basically takes over from Rassilon, forces him off the planet, gets rid of the entire High Council, making him um, supreme executive of Gallifrey, <laughs> and then uses that to uh, uh, get Clara back. Yeah, abuses the power to get right. Clara back, lets her free in the universe, and then immediately runs away again. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, bottom, yeah, bottom. the second you're president of Gallifrey, you're a dick. The web of time. The well, second you're president of Gallifrey, you're a dick. <laughs> so far, the best one we've seen is Romana. <laughs> and Leave and She has her dick moments, so, yep. In that way, it kind of makes sense why uh, the fifth doctor was just like, yeah, I'll like not take that job. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's why he was only dick for a moment and just went, hey, you're and a sucker, I... you're a sucker, you're in control now, bye. <laughs> and I, I think all of the one-off uh, presidents and Big Finish have also been dicks. Pretty much. Nope. No. It's, it's just pretty much an ongoing thing. You're president, you're a douche. It's just the way it goes. How Romana managed to weather that and not become completely and totally a dick, I don't know. Because Romana's How... Romana, Romana's the best. All right. <laughs> so that is our arguments. birthdays. Um, happy birthday, David. Happy birthday, Angus. And we move straight through our news, straight down to Big Finish, because there's no other news this week. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Big Finish. We're going to pimp you up because there's nothing news. else. <laughs> Yeah, it, it really shows you how slow news has been lately when I'm pretty sure we haven't had candy jar books for like two or three weeks. Yikes. <laughs> at, um, least, at least there's something they're peddling out every week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, out in time for the 20th anniversary of Doctor Who comes this mega crossover event. The Legacy of Time consists of Six one-hour audio adventures matching up with people from all over the Hooniverse. Uh, Doctor Who The Legacy of Time is available now on download and in an eight-disc CD set with a limited edition of just 4,000. Uh, the CD limited edition box set is available at £44.99 or £39.99 on download. Okay, just as an aside, I just checked Candy Jar Books' news site. They haven't had an update since the uh, 22nd of May. Oh, wow. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, bar- apparently a slow news week. Mm. All right. So... That's their big 20th anniversary mega crossover event. I can't tell you the episode names because they didn't give them to me. But all I know <laughs> is like every fucking person in there, is, every every freaking person in Doctor Who is in there. You take yeah, a look. They're, they're at stippled the on the cover. <laughs> yeah. The, wait, what is this 20th anniversary? I, I thought we had passed the 20th anniversary. Of That's Doctor the 20th Who. anniversary of Big huh? Finish doing audios. Oh, okay. it's been, Doctor Who one specifically. That's uh, what it was the original, the Five Sirens, so Sirens of Time. Uh, Sirens of Time. Yep. So it's been twenty years since Sirens of Time. Oh. And mm. So this includes Tom Baker, Peter Davidson, Sylvester McCoy, Colin Baker, Paul McGann, um, River Song, uh, Jenny, the Doctor's daughter. Uh. Looks like a metric fuck ton of companions, including the unit cast, um, Bernice Summerfield, Ace, 
uh, the countermeasures group, Romana. I see Pertwee in there, and I guess that means somebody's probably do, uh, doing their Pertwee, uh, their John Pertwee impersonation. Mm -hmm. To which so, yeah. Pertwee's son really should do it. I've seen him a couple um, times now lately, and well, he's looking more he and more at, like Dad. He looks he like the actor playing different. him most of the time. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I swear I heard him recently, and he sounds more like him than before, so... Mm. Uh, you're, thinking, you're thinking of Sean Pertwee? I think so. Um, yeah, because that's the one that occasionally would dress up. Yeah, the one that would dress up like him. I saw him not too long ago. He he yeah. looked and sounded the part. I'm like, and you're afraid to do this? Why? <laughs> Dude, you know, the thing is we would, you know, if Sean Pertwee per would do this, as uh, we would consider it a proper legacy to his father. We wouldn't be oh, like, absolutely. you know, hearing him. It wouldn't be even a question at that point. It's like, yes, thank you, awesome. <laughs> it's yeah, I, I I really wish he would because yes, he looks just like his father at that age. Maybe a little more angular mm. in the face. Maybe a little bit more, enough. yeah, but very close. And mm. like I said, last time I saw or heard him, I swear he's been brushing up on his dad's sound. And sounds a lot more like him these days. If he if he could do that, and God damn, I would love a doc a actual like uh, BBC Doctor Who episode where they <laughs> just bump into the third Doctor. You know, like mm. you know, the current Doctor shows up in the nineteen seventies. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. Yeah. Also, you just see the ca this caped figure uh, turn around a corner, and he's just like, "No." Or no, you're <laughs> just watching the episode from two angles. Where she's or, trying to avoid crossing paths with her past self, or while even trying to, trying to deal with this case from a from you know the opposite angle. The companion is crossing mm. the street, and Bessie drives by. <laughs> uh, so I can confirm. I did go onto the cast page. Tim Trelor is playing the third Doctor. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's the guy that's doing it regularly now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's so. This is their big 20th anniversary. It's an eight disc set with six. One hour adventures plus, you know, behind the scenes making of six one hour adventures. God damn, that's six hours. Jesus, six hours. Yeah, it's <coughs> huge. which is why the CD sets a limited mm. run because mm. that's expensive. And yeah, that's uh, a lot of discs, that so that's why they're keeping most of, of it digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Big Finish is also one of the last people still actually manufacturing CDs these days because mm -hmm. of the digital age. Yeah. Mm. Mm. CDs are going the way of vinyl and tapes and eight tracks. Vinyls well, last vinyls longer. Have come back. Vinyl, vinyl has its ins and outs. Vinyl has come back as a niche market only. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. back as a mainstream. Yeah, people don't put vinyls in their car. Yeah, it's not. Like it's it's not. <laughs> it's not like you can come out. Yeah, you can find vinyls of every album that's released. Mm -hmm. At least not I, very I, easily. I won't find Weird Al's latest album on vinyl. It just won't happen. <laughs> that being said, there's still places making new ones. Yeah, there are, but like I said, it's for a niche market, not the mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's like I think there's some people that still make eight tracks, but it's for a niche market. And it I think Vinyl Doctor Who is probably more about getting signatures on the disc than anything else. Probably. <laughs> true. Mm. Uh, signatures on the album cover, I think. Yeah. Tr oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you don't and want to sign the vinyl. The that's going to scratch it up. <laughs> that's half oh, the reason okay. vinyl has made a, com a, a comeback as album covers. Mm -hmm. People love the old album oh, cover. The album covers yeah. are huge and glorious, yeah. You know, um... Sidetracking us again, um, the radio <laughs> station I listen to, um, 101.5, does this thing. They uh, they kind of pull the public on stuff. And one of the ones they did a couple of weeks ago was, what was your uh, – what do you think was, like, the greatest old-school album cover? And it's like, wow, that's – God, which one's a go with Journey, Sticks? My, my vote was Boston. Boston has some excellent covers, yeah. <clears throat> oh but gosh, I, I, there's so many I, of them. I'm they're literally all racing through my brain. It's like, how do you pick? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, my vote was Boston because I remember going through my mother's uh, record collection when I was like eight. Giant UFO. 
Yeah, seeing the the giant UFO spaceship that with the name Boston on the top and a city on the top. <laughs> Pretty sure that's where they got the idea for the for the Beast Below. By the way, somebody looked at a Boston <laughs> album cover and went, "We can do that." <laughs> and if you look closely, that UFO is actually a guitar. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think at least one of them had like other cities that had exactly the same. But as far as we know, Boston's <laughs> the only one that survived. <laughs> <laughs> they were freaking great album covers. They told a story. It was freaking awesome. But, you know, that was back in the day when album covers were all the rage. Now, you know, they used to fit on CD, and now they're just this little freaking JPEG that goes on the side of your uh, iTunes or... Uh, Media Spotify player. Spotify or whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is currently what's released for Big Finish. Let's take a look at the coming soon. Coming soon. Lala Ward and Sean Carlson reprise their roles as Romana and Narvin, respectively, in the third installment in the Gallifrey Time War series. Exiled and pursued by Rassilon's new regime, Romana and Narvin go to look for their only surviving friend, Leela, in four adventures. Hostiles by David Llewellyn, Nevenor by Lou Morgan, Mother Tongue by Helen Goldwyn, and Unity by David Llewellyn. Gallifrey Time War Volumes 3 and 4 are available for pre-order now ahead of their release in February 2020 and February 2021, each at £22.99 on CD or £19.99 on download from www.bigfinish.com. Yeah, so this, as far as we know, is pretty much trying to pull the Gallifrey series into the canon by trying to go through the Time War. Mm -hmm. The early part mm -hmm. of the Time War and establish how Rassilon came to power and how Romana got kicked out and yada, yada, yada. Interest, it's an it's interesting little story, but, you know, it still makes me raise eyebrows. <laughs> but not as much as this next entry. Catherine Tate returns as Donna Noble in this set, Donna Noble Kidnapped, being the heroine in her own right with a companion of her own. Joined by Jacqueline King is Sylvia Noble and Nikki Wardley as her friend Nat, Donna flies the TARDIS on her own in four adventures. <laughs> Out of This World by Jacqueline Rayner, Spinvasion by John Dorney, The Sorcerer of Albion by James Goss, and The Chiswick Cuckoos by Matt Fitton. Donna Noble, Kidnapped, is available to pre-order now from BigFinish.com, priced at £24.99 on CD and £19.99 on download. Kidnapped? More like self-napped. What? Yeah, it's, it's, it's taking place during the fourth series of Doctor Who. Um, and yeah, apparently the Doctor bows out and she becomes the heroine for a bit. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't buy it. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's apparently they could get Catherine Tate, but they couldn't get David Tennant because he's busy I, voicing Scrooge McDuck. I was going to say, I know that David's busy and all, but for crying out loud. Apparently, yeah. Ugh. I mean, I'm going to wonder how, like, is the implication that it's not so much her flying the TARDIS, but the TARDIS just flying itself? I don't know. They, they, they don't like, really say in that description. I hope yeah, so, it's like, but... I know... Because unless it's like they're just doing kind of a what-if kind of thing, like Big Finishers want to do, where they'll do, like, completely, this probably wouldn't happen, but here you go anyway, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, I'm trying to figure out... Um... Yeah, no, this is her own spin-off series. And I had read somewhere where she was uh uh where it was taking place between, but I do not see that in this article. Mm -hmm. It was one of those things that popped up on my uh phone one time, so I knew this was coming. But uh mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of a weird weird spin-off mm. series cuz you kind of don't think, don't I kind of don't see where it would how it would happen. 
Yeah, I don't see yeah. how it would happen. I mean, unless then... that's literally where the unless that's literally where the kidnap comes from is that she's showing some people around the TARDIS for some reason and the TARDIS just randomly locks them all in and takes off. Or something yeah. like that. There's, there's no way that Donna could fly the TARDIS until she becomes the Dr. Donna. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the thing about this is if Sylvia ever entered the TARDIS, I feel like she would have become a much more mm-hmm. bearable character than she was by her last appearance. Unless this <laughs> ends with everybody's memories being erased. Which, you know, is a fucking stupid reset button. Mm-hmm. And I hate that mm. reset button. It's the dumbest yep. one of them all. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure. It's for me, I'm a little leery on this one. As much mm. as I as much as I like Donna Noble, <laughs> mm-hmm. of of the Russell era, she is my favorite companion. And considering mm. I hated her first appearance, that says something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> considering how annoying she was in her first appearance, that's saying something. Mm-hmm. When I heard she was coming back for a whole season, I was like, oh, no. No, this is going to be the worst season of Doctor Whoever. And, I and like then that you hit that moment season. in the first episode where she find, finds the Doctor, and it's just like, okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. I'll allow this. All right. Like, as, if I, as, if, as, if I, as if I could dictate terms, I'm just like, I'll allow this. <laughs> yeah. And then it just well, came out and it was like, greatest season wow. ever. And then you hit the America. ending, and you're just like, uh, I'm not crying. You're crying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, anyway, that is all of our big finish news and all of our news because there's not a lot. <laughs> yep. So geek reviews. So we move on to the review of shame. Oh. Yep. Oh, re- review of shame first. Okay. Yep. Yep. So uh, I saw the haunts of Nama and. Uh, yeah, it made me. It, it did not make me horny at all. No, 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 sir. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Clarifying that that was an important thing we needed to know. <laughs> yeah, I could have gone without knowing that. <laughs> okay, uh, what yeah, I you all start have visions now. <laughs> <laughs> what I disliked in general. Okay, there was a lot of uh, just plain bad acting. Uh, if I may invoke our beloved Brian Blessed's name, uh, he he shows that, uh, overacting can still be good acting. Acting. Uh, ham acting can still be good acting, but this, a lot of the people were just, it, it felt like, uh, I'm talking loudly now for no reason and emphasizing words that uh, seem to have been written in italics in my script. For <laughs> I don't know. Are, are you claiming Frank Miller wrote the script? <laughs> Not sure if he gets that be. reference. <laughs> I, I know who Frank Miller is, of course. Uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, the, just the, the act, uh, the, the performances, uh, were kind of, uh, distractingly poor. Uh, what I did like about this episode was, uh, the set decorations. It, and just, uh, the, the set dressing. <laughs> It uh, had a like a very look lived in looked feel to it. To it, and uh, I, I I don't know. It just had a like a it looked good. Um, <laughs> that that being said, uh, the, uh, the the costumes of the Naimon uh, weren't that impressive. It made me uh, long for the days of, uh, what do you call it, uh, bubble wrap monsters. And 
So, okay. My favorite scene was the scene where where uh, K9 shows uh, that guy whose boss is like, remove me from this surface, demonstrate your power. <laughs> now, do I, are you going to remove me from this surface or do I have to choke a bitch? <laughs> You know, I would actually love to hear K9 actually say that. <laughs> In John Leeson's voice, mind you. Right. Or do I have to choke a bit? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a terrible John Leeson impression. Uh, it, this episode was a terrible John Leeson impression. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes. So uh, I covered uh, something I liked. Something I disliked. Uh... And I think you covered your favorite scene with Tay Nine there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, least favorite and, scene. And uh, least favorite scene. <laughs> I uh, did not uh, care for the scene where the the bad the the head the head bad guy who is in league with the Naimon uh, runs and finds that there's more than one Naimon and he had, just gets this stupid expression on his face <laughs> like <laughs> so oh yeah uh, hey, where he was going to turn over the girl to one of the Naimon and all of a sudden two more step in and he just has this crazy eyed <laughs> expression for a moment yeah yeah Now, all in all, this episode was, uh, it wasn't a great episode, but, uh, it wasn't that, it wasn't offensive to me, so I will give this an average of three stars. Uh, <laughs> the threes went out, sort of. Which, by the way, does for the average <laughs> of this episode absolutely nothing. Yeah, I believe it's like, yeah. it races like a point zero one yeah, or something. Yeah, I was going to say... It went from 2.9 to 2.9. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> I was going to say, somewhere in the hundreds place, it, it changed. To go up to three. <laughs> yeah, because other than me, everybody gave it a 3.0. And I gave it a 2.5. Directly in the middle of the road. Mm hmm. Stuck in the middle with you. So we had a 3.1 and a 2.9, both of which are circling the middle. <laughs> Gunfighters has thus far been although, our worst at a 1.4. Although the 3.1 had because, everywhere from a 1.5 to a 5, whereas the 2.9 had it from a 2.5 to a 3. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Invasion of the Dinosaurs was all over the place. This one was just, everybody's just like, it's mediocre. Mediocre! Yep. So that's it. That's our, that's the final chime in for Horns of Nyman. It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so moving to Geek Talk. Did you rhyme? What's that, Bill? Did you rhyme that on purpose? Not really. <laughs> I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Yar. All right. So uh, moving on to Geek Talk. Uh, Tim has been watching some old movies. Or Thomas, excuse me. Thomas, Thomas. yes. <laughs> watching some old movies. I'm sorry, I just saw a T and my brain went with it. <laughs> Thomas has been watching some old movies and a couple of the new ones. Mm. So we'll let him um, know. Keep it to about five minutes each, please, Thomas. Oh, yeah, I will try to get through this as quick as possible. Um, the funny thing about the murder on the Orient Express, specifically the 74 version, was that I have never seen any adaptation of this before <laughs> like really? i've watched i've watched poirot i haven't seen the episode of that yet i haven't seen the new movie i haven't seen the version with um oh my god i remembered his name the other day <laughs> how did i forget alfred molina that's it there's a version from the 90s with alfred molina and i haven't seen that either um so yeah, and this was like 
uh, here in Australia, this chain, the cinema chain is doing a sort of Hollywood classics thing. And this was on on Monday. So I got to actually see this in the cinemas. I was the only one there. <laughs> but um, honestly, it was probably a good thing because there was I actually got a lot of laughs out of this, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. Um, it is so bizarre. Like. I knew that this actor, Albert Finney, had done Poirot at least once, but I was like, it was so bizarre. I still think David Suchet is better, but, I mean, you know, to be fair, David Suchet had, like, two decades or something with the role, whereas... This actor only had this one movie, and that was it. Side as note: far as if, I know. if you look up Hercule Poirot on Wikipedia, they show David Suchet's picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Uh. But yeah, like having never seen this before, even though I like, I was vaguely aware of like the twist at the end, which I won't spoil for those who haven't um, seen any. But even though I think some adaptations actually change it just so it's like oh well it's you know this way people who have seen it before or read it or whatever will have something new uh actors i didn't expect to see in this movie um were sean connery <laughs> um post his bond run and uh anthony perkins <laughs> Yeah, that would be yeah. That'd be Sean Connery post his Bond run and before his '80s comeback. Yeah, and yeah, Anthony Perkins like well <laughs> after Psycho. Mm. So <laughs> I think it, um, by the looks of him, slightly before his yeah, this was '70s, so slightly before he came back for Psycho Two. Yeah, mm. like another five um, years out, he would uh, finally do Psycho Two and go oh yeah, this, yeah. on that for a while. This was a very star-studded. <laughs> Um, movie. Mm. I mean, Ingrid Bergman was in there. Yeah. Lauren um, Paul. Yeah. Mm. Of course, that's the funny thing. There were some actors where I was like, I know your face, but I can't place it. <laughs> so, like, I've probably seen them in something where they were, like, I even think, uh, more supporting than they are here. I think a Harry Potter um, actress is in this movie too. Oh. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, one me. of the professors, I think it is. I can't remember her name. Hmm. Maggie Smith. No, nah, it wouldn't be Maggie Smith. I would have noticed. Um. Let's see. Well, the only other female professor that was in the movies was Sprout. I'm mm. trying, I'm at least like to... major ones that we that get uh, named Trelawney. at least uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, this you hear uh, no maybe no no maybe it's just someone that looks a lot like her I think maybe I don't know uh, yeah. Um, yeah then there are act act an actress like Vanessa Redgrave where I'm like I don't think I've seen, like I pro I I don't think I recognized it by face or anything like that. But the name was like, hey, that's familiar. <laughs> um, and stuff like that. But yeah, the the movie is pretty good. I'm glad that I did get a chance to see it in the cinemas. I would argue that people should give this a shot. Um, but if you're like me and you are used to David Suchet, yeah, don't expect a better Poirot than that, but I would say that, I mean, I'd have to see all of the actors to have played Poirot before I could make a clear second place, but at the moment I would say Albert Finney is, like, up there, um, because at the very least, I think the main problem I had was that he was just too loud, like, I'm used to David Suchet being quite reserved and only really getting... Ang and even when he's angry, he's not exactly shouting extremely loudly. It's just that Albert Finney, I guess, just has a louder voice. Well... He can project more. By the way, Albert Finney only ever played Poirot in this. 
he is yeah. also the only actor to receive an Academy Award nomination for playing Poirot. No, so <laughs> he didn't actually win it. Yeah. Uh. Mm. Um, other actors who have played Poirot in film are Austin Trevor, Tony Randall, Peter Ustinov, and Kenneth Branagh. Mm. And I think television is mostly David Suchet. Yeah. Uh, there are a few others, but they're all kind of uh, like weird um, versions. Yeah. Because, like, I know for a fact, I know for a fact that the Alfred Molina one from like the nineties or whenever it was, uh, two thousand one, like set. Yeah, it was like set in that time period. So, like, rather than being a period piece, like this is, mm -hmm. like the seventies one is, and like the two th twenty seventeen one, and most of them are <laughs> really like that was like the only one I think where they tried to modernize it. Yeah, but there's like several like German or, you know, French or whatever adaptations mm. where it's like mm. played by Heine Goebel. I'm not sure who the fuck that is. <laughs> Jose Ferrier. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Ian Holm apparently played um. it once in Murder by the Book. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's like the only – and John um, Malkovich was for the BBC Amer BBC adaptation of the ABC Murders just uh, last year. So oh, wow. yeah, that's like the only names I recognize on this list. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I would say this is worth giving me a shot, so moving on. Um, uh, I think I'll just tackle them both at the same time, uh, mm. Ghostbusters 1 and 2. Um, I, I like. I, I personally Busters. can't believe you've never seen these before. Yeah, that's my yeah. initial thought. <laughs> I feel like I feel like I might have seen bits and pieces of Ghostbusters one, but I just never like sat through the entire thing. Um, and then just like it, it was on. Both of them were on a streaming service that I have now, uh, so I can watch uh, New Who. And I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, I'd been meaning to for a while. But then, like, recently I was like, I I just got home from work. I was fucking tired. I was like, you know what? I just want to put on something. And I was like, you know what? I haven't seen either of these. So one night I put on Ghostbusters. And then, like, a couple of nights later I put on Ghostbusters 2. Or it might have been the next night. I forget. But, yeah, um... While I enjoyed the original Ghostbusters and didn't really have much problems with it, um, outside of mostly nitpicky stuff, I do think Ghostbusters 2 is the better film, and Ooh. I don't know if that puts me in a minority or not. That very it much puts you in a minority. It puts you in a minority, but, yeah. but I, <laughs> welcome to the minority where I think it's no better or worse than the first one. <laughs> mm. I believe, um, I believe slightly lesser quality than the first. But very slight, if any. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I mainly give the second one credit for, like... Keeping it together. Being set, yeah, like, being set five years later and stuff, and being like, well, there's just been no ghost activity since, so they've just all kind of moved on, rather than trying to cling on to something that isn't there anymore. Well, yeah. two of them technically um, are clinging on, but yeah. <laughs> I think. Oh that, yeah, but I mean, like they're all they're all employed. They mm -hmm. all have in one jobs. way or another. They, they're yeah. not trying to. Yeah, they're not trying to scrape by on like what little name value they have left or something. Um. And yeah. I guess it it does help that like the first one establishing the characters, you don't really need like you know the second More movie doesn't the second have one, to yeah. go about. Yeah, the the first one doesn't uh, the second one doesn't have to go about doing that again. Um so you can just go straight into it. Um which I guess is something that actually kind of surprised me um because I I specifically went out of my way when I saw the reboot to see it without the baggage of these two because I didn't I wanted to go in blind to see whether that would to like 
judge the reboot on its own merits. Mm. Um, I don't know where it would sit among the three now, but um, one thing that I will argue that I think I think the reboot did better than the original two is that the, for lack of a better term, token black character in the reboot is better handled because she actually she, serves a purpose. She had Winston, some better moments, me, but I would argue that Ernie Hudson does an um, amazing job in the first two. So no, I'm well, like that's mm. just it to me. Ernie, <laughs> Ernie Hudson, Ernie Hudson feels wasted because it feels like it's just Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Harold Ramis. Oh, and here's Ernie Hudson off well, the Well, mind you, mind like... you, Ernie Hudson was a last minute replacement. They were going. I think it was originally going to be like Eddie Murphy or somebody, and he bowed yeah. out. Um, it was somebody, somebody they knew from Saturday Night Live or SCTV, mm. and that wouldn't surprise out. me. <laughs> the guy bowed out at the last minute, so they got Ernie Hudson on board. Mm. So um. they, so all of his lines and his role was rapidly rewritten. Hmm. But which, like, I could, I, in a way, I can kind of forgive that for the first one, but for the second one, again, it just kind of feels like he's just sort of there. Well, that's because he's the, to, being to be honest, like, the big part oh. about why he's just there is because he's the everyman. He's 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 the one hmm. normal guy in this group of trio of weirdos, <laughs> and that's well, why and he does an I mean, amazing job with that technically, too. Technically, Leslie Jones's character Patty in the reboot is also just. The kind of every woman, Technically, but she yeah. also contributes yeah. more. <laughs> I can I don't see where she contributes any more than Ernie Hudson. Oh did. come on, Ernie Hudson! At uh, the very least, she gets a hell of a lot more dialogue. With the ghost train, was oh, especially the friend. ghost train. <laughs> God, that was freaky. <laughs> we we still... Still... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, That's the moment where you just all the hair stand on end. <laughs> Uh. Uh. <laughs> um, but yeah, otherwise, I can definitely say that, like, you know, nitpicky stuff aside, both of those movies definitely hold up. Because, I mean, yeah, this is me watching these in 2019 with fresh eyes, two movies from the 80s, and it's like, okay, yeah, these do definitely hold up, and I can see, despite okay. the issues I some of the issues I do have, I can see why people like me so much. Um, so moving on from those. By the um, way, uh, before you do really quickly, I was correct. The original script was intending to star Aykroyd, <laughs> Eddie Murphy, and John Belushi. And then John ah. Belushi died. Oh, that's right. John Belushi died mm -hmm. and they had to realter everything really quickly. And that's when yeah. Belushi died was when Bill Murray came in. And, and then they got Harold Ramis in there and then they added, then Murphy dropped out, and then they. Added. I will admit, I will admit, Bill Murray was probably the better choice anyway. <laughs> like I like John Belushi, but I'm sorry, this that was that role was. I mean, it would have been rewritten for Bill Murray anyway, but I feel like Bill Murray would have fit in better anyway. Um, yeah. Also, um, on top of that, because of uh, Belushi's death, uh, that was the inspiration for Slimer. Huh. I believe, nice. and I believe, and I quote from this from the guys who wrote the story: "He is the gluttonous spirit of Jim Belushi." <laughs> Mind you, his name wasn't Slimer in the original. He was no, the they, other, they, just, but... they just gave him. I can't remember what they named him. It was just a generic ghost it of the, was the, originally. It was the he ugly became, little spud. He, yeah, technically, I'm he was nicknamed not... Ugly Little Spud, but he became so popular that he got nicknamed of Slimer because he slimed Bill Murray. Well, yeah, that became his. That mm. became his name in the real Ghostbusters animated series. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, and, yeah. And, and they just kept it when they went to Ghostbusters too. Mm. Which, by the way, um, and, just to just to let you know, Thomas, see. that's why Ghostbusters two was such a disappointment to some of us, is because oh, those yeah. of us that watched this in 1984 had had five years of watching the animated version, <laughs> and basically, oh, yeah. basically, then we get Ghostbusters two, and we're all eager. And it basically destroys everything we 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 built up over the last five years. <laughs> Whoops. 
So, so basically, what mm. every fandom deals with nowadays. That While well, at the same sequel. time <laughs> stealing elements from it. Oh, that's true too. <laughs> Because oh. suddenly, they, suddenly they had different colored jumpsuits, mm -hmm. which were closer to their animated versions. Not necessarily and all the, the way, but they and definitely Slimer threw out the hanging around ones. the firehouse. And Slimer hanging around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which was something that happened in the animated series, but not in the not in the original. Mm. I think if I remember correctly, the 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 original ended with the freaking uh, Slimer just flying, flying at the screen. The yeah. Mm. Shows you how many times I've seen this movie. Well, seen I, I grew up with it. Ghostbusters 2. I don't think I got to see Ghostbusters 1 on a regular basis until the early 2000s. I got to see it in the theaters. I got to see it in the theater because we went to Dubuque I believe, to see this movie. I believe my family got a friend of theirs to record number two off of HBO or something. I remember <laughs> I went with my aunt and her boyfriend. And it's like, what were we going to see? We we're going to see Ghostbusters. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know why I want to see that. And then I came out. It's like a completely awesome movie. <laughs> 1984. I was eight. And by the way, also <laughs> nothing beats Statue of Liberty coming to life, walking across the water, marching down Main Street, mm. and then smashing a building open. <laughs> I'm still yeah. sure that's yeah. part of where Moffat got the idea for Freaking statue <laughs> of Liberty Angle. Yeah, Only well, that's Moffat too. taking did a good idea and ruining it. Yeah, yeah, yeah did it better yeah. 20 years prior. Mm. All right, so your next movie. Uh, uh, yep, so moving on from that to a movie that I saw yesterday, uh, Rocket Man, because it's like, it's fairly late in its run here. It's like, I, I figured it was probably on its last leg, so I should try to go out of my way to see it and well i'll say this much if people had problems with some of the editing and historical revisionism of bohemian rhapsody this movie does not have those problems and is better <laughs> like so. i say that, for... like apparently the version aired in russia has those problems well i'm not surprised well that's russia so yeah um and the ver i doubt this movie will get into china at all <laughs> to be honest that's a um, distinct possibility too given <clears throat> the uh, main character of this particular story mm. um like yeah like it of course it helps immensely that bohemian rhapsody was made with you know members of queen as like producers and that so they would give their input but freddie's been dead for like 20 plus years so we don't have his side of thing mm -hmm. whereas we just have like everyone else's version of what went on and they just have to kind of guess for stuff where no one else was around this had Elton John directly involved. <laughs> so it's like, okay, this, this is, is even if there's probably going to be, <laughs> yeah, like even if there's going to be like a little fictionalizing just to like up the drama or something like that. Um, To me, I could see this for the most part being very faithful to what happened as he remembers it, at least. Um, Though, and the funny thing is, is this has some fantastical elements, but it's in the sense that this is a musical. Like, there are a few times where he's performing, but there are other times where characters will just randomly break into Elton John songs <laughs> throughout, like, periods in his life, because this kind of goes from... Uh, as far as I can tell, this covers a span of, like, from when he was a kid to the early 90s? Oh, be, that would be the span of um, his major uh, popularity run, yeah. Yeah. Because, um, like, the whole crux of this is basically him telling his story in hindsight um, from a specific event that happens. Um, and then just kind of, yeah. We get like his 
abridged life story up till then. Um, and I can even just remember walking out of the cinema and being like, this is kind of the, like, an alternate title for this movie would have been It Gets Better, the musical. <laughs> Because, you know, this is like a guy getting to his lowest point and picking himself back up and going, okay, fuck this, I need to get better and look after myself and stuff like that. Um, which, I mean, yes, spoilers for Elton <laughs> John's life story. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like, honestly, like, I came, there was there were certain times where I came very close to crying and there were actually like once or twice where I I was like okay you got me and even though I wasn't a complete blubbering mess there were definitely tears coming down and I was like Jesus I, I can say this as someone who like Bohemian Rhapsody I went to see because Queen is my favorite band of all time this I went to see because I'd heard just how interesting it was and yeah, this is a goddamn way better biopic and just, you know, a good movie all around. Whereas, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody, there were people saying a lot of stuff about editing issues and too many cuts and this and that, whatever. Yeah, this doesn't have that problem as far as I'm concerned. So long as you like Elton John's music. Like, hell, I didn't even, I'm not really all that big a fan of Elton John. I don't hate him or anything. But honestly, this had the same effect in a way that Bohemian Rhapsody did, where I actually want to listen to more Elton John music now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like more than I already have, which I mean, if you get one thing out of this movie, that's a damn good thing to get out of it. It's like, wow, I actually want to pay attention to this musician more. Which I guess it's kind of funny because now he's on his like final tour ever now. Um, so yeah, um, damn good movie. If if it's you know still available where you are, I would say definitely go see it. Especially if like me, you are in the LGBT plus community because this is the kind of representation we need. Um, as far as I'm concerned, like uh, you know. A story about a queer guy that doesn't end in tragedy. That's not <laughs> um, But anyway, moving on okay. to the last one. Uh, Spider-Man Far From Home. Mm. See, this is funny because I'm going to have to re-watch the other Spider-Man movies that are at least considered good. But I, I would say all of them. I would have to rewatch because I'm more forgiving on some than other people. As it stands, having only seen it the once, Spider-Man Far From Home might be in the front running for my favorite live action <laughs> Spider-Man movie of all time. <laughs> and I specify live action because I feel like uh, Spider-Verse probably still has that spot if you went by overall. But this comes damn close. Mm. Because holy shit. I've seen some complaints about this movie, but eh, I have yet to see an MCU-related movie that I don't at least like. And this would definitely be up there among the better MCU movies. Um, Mysterio is great. Tom Holland the Spidey is great. Um, I can understand why this version of MJ doesn't click with people, but to be honest, I was never really interested in the MJ we got in the Raimi movies, so... Eh. No, uh, no. <laughs> it's, it, for, it's not the Raimi um, movie I, I compare it to. It's, it's the, the, comic original, one. the original comic. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. That's fair. Um, but I guess at the same time, this is kind of merging... Uh, different stuff anyway. I mean, this version of Spider-Man has um, Ned, who I'm pretty sure is a... Uh, God, what is he? Um, a Miles Morales sidekick, as opposed to, well, like, character supporting character rather than 
Peter Parker. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of merging universes going on, which is going to make it awkward if they ever actually do a live action Miles. But yeah, whatever. Um, I, I like maybe it's just me, but I like this MJ. But I really think that's just because if I was in Peter's shoes, yeah, the weird gothy seeming chick is probably the one that I would be <laughs> looking over as well. So I can kind of see where he's coming from. Um, you know, so again, yeah, maybe that's just me. But um I do like this MJ and she does get some development in a way. Like at least you sort of break through that shell a bit. Um <coughs> And stuff like that. Um, Ned as well, I liked in this movie. Um, uh, actually, the uh, character... Pretty much Ned, every character. Actually, the character Ned is usually a Daily Bugle character. Ah. Ned Leeds is usually a... Uh, well, he's technically a combination of Ned Leeds and what was the Miles Morales friend? I can't remember now. But yeah, he's uh, technically a com- combination of They might of share a kids. name because he's supposed to be an Ultimate Universe character originally when he's yeah. with Miles. Oh yeah, yeah it, it could just it could just be that there's an AU Ned Leeds that was that it's yeah. It was something Lee. I can't remember what his, uh, what his first name was. Dan. I'll hurt you. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> there was. There, it was someone from Miles' uh, universe originally. And then, of course, like, uh, as with everything, when things oh. suddenly get too popular, they combine them together. <laughs> um, uh, Genki Lee or yeah. something is what it is. So, yeah, they basically combined that character and... Ned Leeds. Um, Ned Leeds, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was revealed to be the Hobgoblin. Oops, spoilers. Um, actually, that was also a fake. Yeah. He was he was brainwashed to believe he was uh, pretending to be the hobgoblin. Yes, that's not spoiler, contrived spoiler. at all. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, like I enjoyed the absolute hell, and I can, and to a point, I can see where people who know. You can base like if you know anything about certain a certain character in this movie, you'll know where this is going. But though there have been, I've seen at least a review where someone was like, the first hour kind of lost was kind of kind of lost them a bit, but then picked up in the second half. Um, once the flip happens, and it's like, okay, yeah. I can kind of see where people are coming from from that, but eh, I enjoyed the ride to get to that point. And my God, some of the shit they do, the visuals in this movie, my God, can we please <laughs> get a Scarecrow movie now? Now! I want it! Give oh, God, that. yes, that scene. Like, please! Like, that's... I want Warner Brothers to look at that stuff and go... Okay, get us get a Batman movie with Scarecrow as the villain in production right now, and either get this director to do it, or get James Wan or someone who's like good with horror shit, but will take note from that and just do it. Because my God, and throw this much money at it because just holy fuck, that was so amazing, like. I can't even think of any superhero. Like, I pre- you pretty much have to dip into the games to get visuals like that. So the fact that they pulled that off is just like, shit. Like, that's just opened up so much possibilities. But I hope people do, to a point, rip this off for other characters it would work for. Like, it's just insane. Um, It's kind of funny, because even though... Randy kind of spoiled it last week, but J. Jonah Jameson comes back and there's J.K. Simmons and that. I almost expected to um, get hit in the gut by that, but I didn't, which was like, oh, okay. But I also kind of like that it's not this big fanfare reveal that they got him back 
and it's just kind of, yep, here he is. Because <laughs> you would almost expect that they would, but I guess they're just well, like, it's... well, if you didn't see the Raimi movies, here he is, whatever. It's, it, it's the equivalent of saying that there's gravity or that the sky is blue. You don't need a big <laughs> deal for that. It's obvious. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So J.K. Simmons started started playing the character in the Sam Raimi films. Mm-hmm. From that, he's of course done this, and he's was also uh, J. Jonah Jameson in the Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Avengers Assemble, Ultimate Spider-Man, Lego Marvel Superheroes, Maximum Overlord, Overload, and Hulk and the Agents of Smash. Mm. So he basically became the animated voice of J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> My the only thing disappointing me ab- about him is that if um, based on certain spoilers for a movie I haven't seen that I seem that I've picked up, we're probably not going to get a, one of my favorite scenes with JJ from the comics that I would have loved to see reenacted. Mm. I'm I'm going to prefer mm. for the guess that it involves Captain America. Yeah. Uh Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, considering um, the fact that Captain America stood down after Endgame, so. Although, actually, I don't know everything don't know. about how his story ended up, so it's still possible that he could still have that conversation. I don't know. Um, no, the actor is done. Um, yeah. Oh, I thought they would have transitioned to a different actor based on the photos I've been seeing. What? Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> have you not seen Endgame, Bill? No, I haven't. It's not oh, on Netflix. Oh, dear, Bill. Okay, you need to still see Endgame. <laughs> yeah, it's not on Netflix, so I haven't been able to see it. Oh, well, dear Lord. Well, of course Lord. it's not I mean, on could... Netflix. It's still in theaters. Oh, okay. So, unless I win the lottery. <laughs> or I do something illegal. I'm not going to see it. Yar, <laughs> har, fiddity. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I love this movie. When this movie comes out, I'm going to have to buy it. <laughs> mm. I've, been, I've been hearing a lot um, of people it's top, definitely topping their uh, yeah. Spider-Man list lately. I, yeah. just lo- I just love the beginning of it. So I've got this plan on how to get together with MJ. I'm like, oh my god, this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that based on something I can't, I won't spoil, but that involves the J. Jonah Jameson thing. When that hit, and the movie ends, and goes to the first lot, like, and, and that was, like, the mid-credits, when it goes to the full normal credits, I'm it's like, long list, yeah. oh god, oh god, we've had Civil War, and now we've had this, does that mean we're leading to what I think we're leading to? Please, god, no. <laughs> I doubt we will. But, you know, there is a very specific storyline that I'm aware of that happened in the wake of Civil War in the comics. And, and it I'm turned like, out please to be tell garbage. me we're not going and please tell me we're not going towards that because I, and I think that's why on. I think that's why you're people not, didn't like the You're not talking the big Marvel event, you're talking the Spider Man thing that happened during yeah. Civil War. Hmm. Oh. You're um, you're you're, you're, talk, you're are you talking one more day? Yes. <laughs> no, I don't think they're heading towards one more day. At least not yet. I don't. I don't think uh, they'll go to one more day. Well, I don't think. All, I don't think Aunt May is dying anytime soon. At least not yet. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> no, and <laughs> there's no marriage to sacrifice yet. That mm-hmm. too. True. Yeah, I but don't... it's just like yeah, like part of me is just like instinctually like connecting the dots and like no. oh god. No, yeah, I, I'm see, I'm pretty sure crazy. even the movie runners on this are like, let's not, because that was a lot do, of bad takes. For them to do yeah. that terrible I guess... story, they would have to do all the good stories with adult Spider-Man first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. and and the fact I I the fact that one more day is grossly unpopular, and the people that mm. are behind this know that. Yeah, they've been smart you know, enough to pick and choose the good parts. And I'm pretty sure if Joe yeah. G went to the writer and said, let's do a movie version of One More Day, the writers would kick him in the dick and move on. Uh, they they, 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 they throw him into the Sony offices where they, they can do like, an animated version and it'll or they flop. Would do, or they would just go completely lateral with it and be like, okay, Matt Murdock makes a deal with Mephisto for everyone to forget his identity. <laughs> <laughs> Because you realize that that was a Joe Cheese storyline. Mm. 
if you don't know who I mean by Joe Cheese, that's Joe Casada. Hmm. He was the <laughs> head writer for Spider Man at the time. Okay. And he's a complete total schmuck. I was, I was thinking, I was like, I couldn't remember off the top of my head, but I was like, I thought I had heard it attributed, I'm thinking Casada, but I couldn't remember his name. And mm -hmm. then the way, the way you said it, I thought you were saying like a Chinese name. No, I, I call, like, we, we, his nickname for mm -hmm. some people that know him is Joe Cheese, because Got if you, you look at Casada, it looks like quesadilla. Like it, <laughs> not, with, without that context, I was thinking like you said like Cho Chi or something, like a no. Chinese name. And I'm like, I have no idea who that is. <laughs> Then no, you're no, not listening to the it. English words coming out of his mouth. <laughs> well, no, it, I can't see your face, so it's harder. For me, it, it especially comes from, uh, there was an episode of uh, Superhero Squad, you know, that, that, that cartoon, where there's just mm -hmm. a point where somebody looks to, the, looks to the screen and goes, Casada, it's extra cheesy. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh my god. They made fun of him in his own, in the, the cartoon that he freaking executive produces. That's fucking uh, great. So ever since then, he's, mm. yeah. Whenever he's not looking. <laughs> Kasada. <laughs> Any, uh, are we good be, then? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Basically, he's like, if if you enjoy the Marvel movies, and if you specifically enjoyed Harm Coming, I would say go see this. All right. All right. So with that, I guess we move on to mine then. Mm -hmm. So I just recently finished... Uh, the uh, Doom 2016 uh, game, which is still, in my opinion, better known to be Doom 4. There's no reason to get rid of the numbers. It's literally Doom 4. <laughs> you are still the Doom guy, aka now officially named by the demons as the Doom Slayer. And you are accidentally resurrected because, guess what? A demon invasion happened on Mars again. You take it upon yourself to be the one man badass that the Doom Marino always is, and starts uh, slamming down monsters even worse than usual. Um, they brought back a lot of the classic monsters they've been kind of hinting at, but never really completely brought back from Doom Three. Um, and they also brought they added new twists, including the ability to stun demons and then completely obliterate them in numerous horrific ways, snapping arms, breaking legs, crushing skulls. You can even get the rage power up again in this game for the first time since like two, and you can literally rip demons apart with your bare hands. Like literally, you can grab an imp and split them down the middle of just your bare hands. As you do. Um, you can punch and kick them and they'll explode into giblets. Um, they brought back the Barons of Hell, which are an upgrade from the Knights of Hell, which were introduced in, uh, Doom 3 as the new big nasty. Um, and we now know where the, uh, evil, uh, demonic spiders come from. Apparently they're warped humans. Um... That and there's been like several references, not only with the fact that they actually added plot and story and background to this game, but also if you're watching very closely in the levels, there's literally the end boss of Doom 2 in a scene, and you can shoot him in the forehead like you did in the original game with the rocket launcher, and he unlocks a special for you. There, I gave you something that you could use if you ever played the game. <laughs> um... I originally was playing this game on medium and realized my computer wasn't even chugging. I put it on high graphic mode and it still didn't chug. Whatever it does for programming with their games is a fucking amazing. I can't wait for the sequel. Speaking of which, for the sequel, at the end of this game, they do bait you into a to be continued. <laughs> Literally, you go through all this shit to try and get this artifact to close the portals and officially come back. In the uh, the guy Samuel Hayden, who is now a cyborg, uh, uses the tether that he added to your suit to bring you back to Earth, uh, to Mars, takes the artifact away from you before you can really react, and immediately sends you back to hell because he doesn't trust you because he knows you're going to stop him from messing around with hell some more. So yeah, it's a big, it's a very big, and we put you back to be continued. <laughs> So I'm not surprised at all that we're going to be dealing with the invasion of Earth with the next game. 
because obviously Hayden did something stupid and everything went to pot again. Because UAC can't seem to learn. Um, there's a lot more development on the Doom Marine. There's at least, I want to say, a good six, vo uh, at least a good four, if not six, fully voiced tablets from the demons themselves detailing the feats and horrific things he's done to the demons. Quote unquote horrific <laughs> things he's done to the demons in his uh, many ventures through hell. Are they uh, descriptions of recognizable things from the first three games or just? Uh, the, the thing is, I can't seem to find enough details for number three, which really does lead to the idea and credence that maybe three is like a side adventure or something. But there does seem to, uh, but like there's still monsters like the uh, uh, the Hell Knights, which lead credence to three being part of the same universe. So mm. kind of, huh? Um, but they do very boisterously tell you about his uh, epic badassery and taking down giant monstrosities in the previous two movie uh, games before that. So yeah, he's mm. very much the first two games. The third one seems to still be a weird hazy middle. Um, speaking of which, uh, Doom 3 was more of a pop-up and scare you kind of thing. Doom is a big mm -hmm. return to you walk into a huge room and then suddenly everything starts teleporting in and wants to rip you apart. Um, add on to that, it's it, more it, than... It, it, it returns to the praise the Lord past the ammunition. Yes. And to that, by the way, they add a lot more to it than just side-swiping and sidestepping and trying to dodge stuff. You got sidestepping, you got jumping, you got double jumping in this game. Uh, you get weapon unlockables, which do uh, different things when you hold down the right mouse button. Like grenade, like your machine, your uh, bleh, your uh, basic shotgun. If you right, hold down right click, depending on which attachment you have on it, will either do a burst shot, which will be a double shot, or it'll act like a shotgun grenade launcher. But what if you type in the Konami code? I'm pretty sure it does nothing because you don't have a controller on your PC. <laughs> Um, not to mention you get to restart at every, uh, save point anyways, and there's no limit on lives, so go ahead, keep dying. <laughs> I, I would also add that much like all the other previous Doom games, I beat this on the, the medium mode, the middle one, which I believe there's always usually about four to five difficulties. So yeah, I didn't take it easy on myself. I just went, yes, we're going for the, at least the middle ground. Hurt me. <laughs> I died once in a while, but usually it was because there's just so much rocking hard music oh. you can't hear when a demon's up behind you ripping you apart. <laughs> just realized we're past the hour mark. Oh, yes, we are. Just past it. Um, But yeah, in short, really, really love this game. And again, I play this on high and my PC didn't chug. There are games yes, I play on high and it... That. There's games that I play on high, and it just makes... You can hear the poor graphics card fan going. Um, and if it's, and it looks like the next sequel will be using the same engine, so thumbs up to id if they keep things running smoothly. Because yeah. id is just doing awesome right now. I am, I am still waiting for the... Uh release of metroid prime 4 which has a lot of the same features apparently that doom did so hey. <laughs> fantastic it sounds like a it sounds like a good step for it yeah well they're they're gone back to retro studios the one that made the first three games so yeah, like, beca yeah because they went to ninja and ninja made the most boring and oddball metro uh, metroid game ever so it's like yeah let's just go yeah. back well they started prime in-house and then they looked at what was, what came out of it in their test version and went, nope, not good enough. And they're just like, okay, scrap this, hire Retro to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about that. Yeah, that, right. that's a good move because they know what they're doing. So. Yep. All right, so let's move on to our episode summary. Who is up to today? That's I thought it was Yep. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I believe I'm ready, and if not, All we'll right. find out. Uh, just a moment. I need to bring up the stopwatch really quick. Uh, yeah, I need to actually... Here. 
Sorry, I'm I, I'm sitting here and it's like, oh wait, I need to go to DuckDuckGo and get the stopwatch. And then I need to bring it back over here. And paste. Loading, there we go. Awesome. And all right, ready? I'm ready. Starting in three, two, one, go. Okay, so this takes place on Earth in the future, under the sea. <laughs> see, da -da -da -da. Uh, in an incredibly spacious uh, base slash submarine. I wasn't sure whether this was supposed to be like a, a base or a movable submarine. Uh, anyway, uh, we're in the middle of a cold war between two uh, fac factions of human beings beings and on board this uh human submarine type vehicle are two uh double agents for the opposing side that everyone is fighting against who are working to sabotage the uh the submarine base and so the other side can win when an interesting thing is that they have nuclear missiles, and, but they can only be launched if a crew member actually gets, puts on a hairdresser thing and sinks his brain with the computers, and that authorizes the, the missiles as a failsafe. Safe. Safe. So... The people who are the double agents uh, use the guy who is the sinker. Uh, that's my my term, not theirs. Uh, to to uh, like they they use the uh, they trick the the guy into uh, they they brainwash him with a uh, brainwashing CD. As to you do. run around destroying the sabotaging the submarine and into all of this comes the doctor Tegan and Turlo the doctor says I'll show Tegan uh, the planet earth in the future sure. but unfortunately they land straight on to a submarine in the middle of uh, a military drill and they're captured and they think the captain of the submarine thinks that the doctor is a spy sent from uh, the enemy agencies. To make things even more confusing for the poor doctor, the Sea Devils and the Silurians show up with an electro-giant seahorse uh, and they plan to take over the submarine base, base, launch the nuclear missiles out at everyone so that other people will retaliate with the nuclear missiles and the Earth will be uh, pretty much uh, wiped out of humanity and the Silurians and the Sea Devils will just wait in hibernation for, you know, like, the 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 stench of human corpses to go away and the radiation to go away and they'll just uh, reclaim the planet as their own. Leave the fresh scent of pine. Yes. <laughs> uh, the doctor says we need to work this out. We need to talk. But uh, all the human beings are saying no. There's no time. They're gonna launch the missiles. The missiles. Uh, you, you need to kill them uh, with poison gas. Yes. And the doctor says, I don't like it. Okay. So, the doctor uses a hexachromite uh, compound to kill all the Silurians. Silurians. And he uh, uses the brain computer sync thing to uh, plug himself into the computer 
to stop the missiles that were going to uh, uh, destroy humankind. And the, the, the whole episode ends with uh, everyone except the companions dead. And the doctor says, damn, this sucks. The end. Alrighty. Stop. So that was about four minutes, I want to say 50 seconds. So pretty much right on the money. Just about on the money. A little bit All under. Right. So let's see what we liked about this episode overall. And Tim, you are first, actually. Oh, boy. Okay. Something I liked about this episode. I just liked to... Uh, getting to revisit uh, two of my favorite uh, uh, species, the Silurians and the Sea Devils. I thought you were going to say your favorite companions. I was going to say, Turlo's one of your favorite companions? Oh, God, no. <laughs> 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 wow. <laughs> Sharp turn against Turlo there. <laughs> oh, well, the, the, the best thing I can say about Turlo is, at least he's not Tegan. Ooh. Oh! 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 <laughs> oh! Them's fighting work. <laughs> Ooh! Shots uh, fired <laughs> right across I, I, the bow. I don't, I don't know why, but every episode of with Tegan I've seen, you know, like it, it's just that everything she says just rubs me the wrong way. You, you and Tegan have opposite outlooks on life, so I can see that. <laughs> You know, it's and it's like it's designed to bug me what what everything says, but but anyway, anyway, the uh, the welcome reappearance of the Sea Devils and Silurians and getting actually getting to see them them uh, join forces so to speak was an interesting thing, and I did like uh, the Sea Devils uh, samurai armor. Uh, I will talk about that later. I'm sure a couple of us will. <laughs> At least parts of it. <laughs> Matt! Overall thing I liked about this episode? Mm hmm Um... Hmm, there's actually a couple of things. I'm actually trying to decide which one I want to go on about. Um, I definitely liked the B-plot of this episode. The uh, whole the whole uh, brainwashing the guy to uh, send up the nukes and start World War Three kind of deal. Yeah, that was actually an interesting mm -hmm. plot, and they, then they had some good stuff going with that. The only time the B plot turned sideways and stupid is when it combined into plot A and just fumbled on its face. Well, it wasn't really that they were supposed to fire off the nukes. He was well, they were, they, they were trying to steal the information the and trying to stop yeah. them from being able to use the nukes, yeah. Yeah, they were sabotaging the base. And then they were going. Then the base was going to be wiped out by an attacking force of that guy's side, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still, it was a really interesting subplot for what we got here for the rest of it. Alright. Bill? I like the intern. Uh, he had good rationale and would have made good decisions if not for the dick in charge of him telling him to ignore safety protocols and we don't need to figure out why the guy died and yeah sure you're just a student but we're just gonna you know put you in this high intensity situation that could mean the lives or deaths of millions of people uh for convenience sake oh yeah <laughs> and this was before he got yeah but mind bent yeah Right. So he's like, you know, he's like, I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, we should be figuring out what went wrong. And I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. I applaud you for your good decision making. Unfortunately, you don't have the power to enforce those decisions. So you're dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Thomas. Uh, um. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm gonna think of something that hasn't been taken already. Uh, There's a few other things I can name. Just say you like Tegan to piss off Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, um, I mean, I guess I kind of like the the doctor's persistence to just try and like prevent this from what inevitably happens, and like, because that seems to be like the trend with these stories is that first one he's like, okay, the they the seeming to leave us alone and then the the brigadier blows them all up and then i cannot remember the sea devils that well but that doesn't end well either and he's just like okay well, most because the charm. master forces them into it. a dumb position and everything back yeah fired. yeah <laughs> yeah and then with this it's like okay third time's a charm i can totally do it this time oh shit no okay <laughs> um but you know he's at least trying yeah, in fact, he pretty much spectacularly fails with the Silurians and the Sea Devil across the board. Mm-hmm. Probably his I was gonna... his one of his biggest black marks. I, I was planning to discuss that later. Mm. <laughs> even in New Who. Yeah, even New Who <laughs> still screws it up once in a while. Mm. Does he screw it up, or is it those meddling humans? Call me, call me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, I like the intern's little girlfriend, who was basically his support pillar for that until he was forced to kill her. Yeah, that was grimdark. Yes, it was. It was very grimdark. Mm. But I like that she was there, and she was the one that was, you know, keeping him from, you know, going off deep end. Everything. Mm-hmm. I thought the character. I thought the character and actress did a good job at that. Yeah, I this- also liked <laughs> Tegan. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can I say that though? Did you the... really like Tegan, or are you just saying that? <laughs> I always liked Tegan. Mm. I mean, Tegan's got for her me, moments. it was mostly just. For me, it's just mainly nice and like a nice kind of change to hear an Australian accent for, <laughs> in <laughs> Doctor because you don't that often. Is, is it a real Australian here, accent, or is, oh, is it feel oh like yes, it. that is that is very much a. She's actually got an Australian oh, okay. accent, and she's not trying to Steve so, Irwin it. So it's not, it's not even, it's not even close to a Nicola Bryant situation. Okay. <laughs> oh uh, no. I last I checked, Janet Fielding is. Oh no, she's she is an Australian actress. Okay. I never she, looked her up. I don't think. She was born think, so. in Brisbane. Yeah, I yeah. think I think or she's supposed to be pretending to be more British than she is, and she's failing because, because <laughs> I've heard no, I've heard her in um other interviews. And I don't know if it's mm. sense doctor or what, but her uh, Australian accent has really been toned down. Hmm. Uh, when I've, when yeah. I've heard her and other stuff, she sounds proper British. So oh, so maybe it's just I mean, yeah. working in the UK. Yeah, I'd say so. Most likely, if you've so been like there how long like, enough, yeah, she became, she yeah, became yeah. regional. <laughs> yeah, so like how people from Australia will move to the US and sometimes will just completely lose the accent to the point that you can't even tell that they were originally Australian. You, you mean or, like how my mother moved to Canada and now says A <laughs> at the end of every other or, sentence. There's also like some um some English YouTubers I know I've seen that um when they're airing something for an international audience, their accent is very toned down like somewhere between like RP and American. But then when it's specific <laughs> For like a UK audience, they have like their full regional accent on strong. <laughs> mm-hmm. So basically, That's like watch, David yeah. on, or like Peter Capaldi on Doctor Who compared to what they'd normally sound like. Mm-hmm. Most likely. Um, All right. I, uh, before All right. we move on to bad stuff, I'd like to say the other side good thing I felt was just the side characters in general. Were a lot more interesting than some of our main cast, yeah, to be honest. And they all weren't right. all terrible all the time. <laughs> all right, so let's go to what we disliked. Tim? Uh, what I disliked, uh, the doctor actually uh, said it best. There should have been another way. <laughs> God, uh, yeah, this episode is so freaking grim dark. Welcome to uh, 80s British television and sci-fi. Yes, but this was particularly Mm. bad. 
because the body count in this one, I think, is worse than most Dalek episodes. Mm. As bad as this yeah, the, most Dalek the episodes. The fifth Doctor gets a lot of high body count episodes. It's... Mm-hmm. Because I think, <laughs> I think what they established at the end of it was everybody's dead, Dave. The entire yeah. fucking base is dead. Yep, that's pretty much what they established yeah. at the end they, of this one. They're pretty one. much just walking through the bodies back to the TARDIS. It, it doesn't help. It's, no, mm. it's no wonder Tegan mm-hmm. left at the end of this season. Right. If every single episode <laughs> yeah. is ending in a body count of that magnitude. Right. It it doesn't mm. help that the moral of every Silurian episode seems to be humans are trash, Silurians are trash. If you put them together, there will be trash and bodies everywhere. <laughs> like, that just seems to be what Silurians are used to communicate. Mm. Well, like in the first one, it's more like the Silurians in trash. charge at first were like fine but there was like a silurian that was like no we have to take it back from them ah and then you know i think i think still the moral is either way no matter which side you look at there's gonna be a hole set ruining for everybody yeah Hmm. there's bad eggs on both sides Mm -hmm. all right okay go ahead it seemed kind of contrived that uh the doctor couldn't come up with a solution well, he did. They people just kept rejecting it. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk mm-hmm. this out. No, we're done talking. Well, well originally he wanted to talk it out, but then they sent the started. giant monster to destroy it's, everything. It's like, oh it's shit! Like, it's like, what? You know, it, it would be a shame if you particularly died. We should try to keep you alive. You're like, no, kill me. Like, really? <laughs> that's that. That's your solution? No, kill me. <laughs> you'll have you'll have to kill me because otherwise I'm killing everyone else. But... Mm. You'd think, though, even the doctor would have been a little more depressed at the end of this. Eh. Mm. So, okay. Matt. Well, he didn't he exactly look happy at the end of this. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, but still, I mean, you know, if you think about how a modern doctor would react, he, it, would mm. be, it would be pretty bad. Anyway, Matt, what about you? What did you dislike about this? I disliked the floppy rubber suits that just end that up. Mm. I, I'm sorry, the the giant monstrosity, which was a, uh, a two guys in a bi- big foam rubber suit, absolutely ridiculous it looking. Looked, it looked like they were putting on a stage show in the in the sea base. Pantomime Godzilla. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pantomime Reptilicus. Uh, uh, he's not the quality of Godzilla. Um, well, no, that's the whole thing about that when you say pantomime. I mean, if you know what a pantomime horse looks like, yes, there's well, no way you're even, gonna a, even a pantomime Godzilla would be better than this thing. <laughs> mm. Pantomime Reptilicus, the the really awkward um, recycled '70s suits for uh, what's their what are they called again? The Silurians. And the sea devils. And, yeah. the, and the reused sea devil heads. Yeah. Just, yeah, just, mm, this doesn't add and, up quite And, you know, well. most of those things had been in storage for, you know, freaking 10 years or more. And they did not last well. Yeah, mm. especially when one of them looks like he's smiling every time he looks anywhere near camera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, they all do, really. Uh, they've all got this, like, perpetual dirt face. <laughs> yep. And the oh. eyes were like, yeah, completely derped. Mm. Oh, and uh, on top of those <laughs> eyes, by the way, if you watch carefully, then the close-ups you can see the people in the suits blinking. Mm. That just <laughs> just if it if the mood already ain't ruined, it's ruined even further. Yeah, this is this is the suits that mm. proved the PC was out of money, or at least didn't have any to give to Doctor Who. It sure as heck didn't give any to Doctor Who because they just went, you can just reuse these suits from the 70s, right? Just just put them on. Here, I'll even give you some do- dopey look at samurai suits to finish off the yeah, other ones. Because, um, yeah, you know, the Cybermen, you know, they, they, they take some money and they redesign the suits. They you didn't in the 70s. Oh, yeah, the, the 80s. 70s, they did. This yeah. is the 80s we're talking about, for dude. The fifth, for the yeah. fifth Doctor, they did, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, mm. you would have thought they would have come back and said, yeah, I think we need to redesign these suits. Mm-hmm. Or at least, at the very least, you know, recreate them. Do at least some sort of update to them, yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And instead we got leftovers. So it was pretty I mean, bad. really, comparing them, it looks like they did remake them just really shoddily. If they... If... <laughs> Uh, from what I've understood, no, they did not. 
No, they're they Might basically have, just I, dusted I, off the old suits. I think like, I, I've I, I've I, put I, images of both in the in the podcast chat. I think that's the lighting difference. Oh no, there's actually some change in the head, but that might have been also from warping, though, from sitting around. Like we said, they replaced the eyes, and that was about it. And the mouth thing could have been just warping. Although, actually, no, there's yeah. different texture yeah. to the cheeks too. Um, Yikes, yeah, they, the they did the try. Ridges, that seems sadder. Different. Yeah, it is because mm. because the original looks so much better. The original mm. looks angrier and more effective, even in its time. Yeah. Just wow! Right. And like the, the sort of glowing thing in the forehead looks oh, yeah, like that's part of the ridge, different. as and, opposed mm -hmm. to like this orb <laughs> on the yeah. top. Yeah, it's supposed to be a third eye. It's too high in theirs to be a third mm. eye. Um, but no, right. I mean the, the sea devils suits were were re hit. Were re Oh yeah, they the sea devils were definitely just borrowed. Yeah. yeah, they were. They didn't put any effort into those. They just repainted them, reused the old ones, and put samurai suits on them. <laughs> for some reason. And you look at this. You look at the detail on the original suits. That the 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 the, the detail on the, <laughs> the the scale work. And then you look at mm. the ones they made in the eighties, and oh my god. <laughs> They're like, who the fuck redesigned these, and why the fuck did you let him? <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, uh. none of them holds a candle to the new Who stuff because mm -hmm. mm. they, they have they can do so much better with prosthetic these days. Yeah. Uh, but still, yeah, these were just ugh, terrible, terrible, terrible suits all right bill what about you what did you dislike um so okay so we already talked about the whole um issue at the ending so my other issue was that i hate stories where the villain is whispering and you have to lean real close to your tv to hear them especially i don't i don't know what month this aired but it's july here every room has either a fan or an air conditioner running you cannot hear that unless you crank up the volume really loud. And then somebody in the next room is liable to get pissed off. So <laughs> I just hate, hate it when they do that with the character. And that's what the sea devils were like here. And it was just very frustrating. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about that because I'm just turned the damn volume. Uh, this was originally broadcast in January of 80. Ah, uh, the final the final episode was broadcast on my birthday, when I turned <laughs> six. No, when I turned. So eight. there were no there were no air, so there were no air conditioners running in the UK at that time. Maybe if they all maybe if they um, simulcast it in Australia, there were ACs running. But ah, <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, I well the thing is it was like I think you mentioned it was basically the same as the Ice Warriors voice. Yeah. Mm. And so, by the from what I can recall uh finding a clip on YouTube, yeah, they always sounded like in their first appearance they sounded like this as well. Well, then it's good that they kept the the sound correct. I I do blame the original for making them sound like Ice Warriors. Mm. Hey, BBC Radiophonic, you've used that voice before. For the Sea Devils, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Thomas, how about you? What did you dislike about the episode? Um, oh, most of what I've taken. So let's see if there's anything left. Um, honestly, the um, I mean. I am by no means the smartest person in the room, but <laughs> for some reason, and maybe just that I was so kind of bored by this that I couldn't really follow the plots <laughs> a lot. Like, I knew what was happening, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, so why is this B-plot even happening? What are they doing? Like, 
to the Sil- like I even forgot before rewatching this that the Silurians apparently even had a motivation. I don't even know if they still did because it's just kind of a hand wavy. Oh, well, you know, we're wipe up the Earth. It's revenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah so we've they- had enough for taking <laughs> over. Yeah, was it revenge yeah. or pest uh, pest control or something in between? Mm-hmm. And knowing the story, which is funny because it's control. like. Which is, yeah, which is funny because it's like the, I mean, the timeline for exactly when the Pertwee stories happen is weird. Um, Late 70s, early 80s. But, 70s or 80s, depending. Yeah, yeah it dep- <laughs> depending on what they want. Because, you know, like, the invasion apparently happened in 1980, so that makes the third Doctor's very weird. Whatever. Um, the timeline, but, the timeline's all fucked up, yeah. Yeah, um, but this is this is something airing in eighty four takes place in twenty eighty four. The Silurians haven't tried this in that intervening <laughs> time. Like when when did the sea devils? Oh yeah, the sea devils took place during the unit time as well, right? So yeah, in the late seventies, like early eighties. Yeah, there. those were both Pertwee stories, and then this is like so, the two Doctors later. I mean, he didn't time travel in either of those stories, I don't think. So, well, they it, both... might have, it might have taken a hundred years for the Silurians to dig themselves out and went, okay, that's it, hmm. fuck them. <laughs> that is distinctly possible, um, though. You think they they have the technology to drill mm-hmm. faster? Yeah, because it is, and it is kind of funny because it's like, okay, so you had like a hundred years or so to plot this, and this is your best shot like this is seemingly your only shot like that's it (laughs) you think they would have played like you think they would have had a better idea than yeah like like, several backups than this they they would have they they had a problem with glasnost and you know the fall of the wall and (laughs) the the destruction of the soviet union so Hmm. They had to wait for for tensions to ratchet up to that on the on the brink of World War Three again. Hmm. Hmm. That might have been Which actually a more legit a... excuse that they were trying to do it incognito and not look like their <laughs> their hand was showing. No, we didn't wipe out the human race. We swear. We just we happened just... to wake up because we heard all the racket upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, that's actually the funny implication is that the Cold War is still going. <laughs> in this. Well, it seems well, to be some sort of new Cold War, some, but yeah. He was saying basically the same thing. He didn't necessarily say it was the same two factions. Mm. So. Well, yeah, they're very vague about who it, who's who's like, at who's next right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Salamander supporters <laughs> and the Democrat and the democracy supporters. Far as <laughs> wrong, know that could wrong, be the case. Wrong timeline. That was what 2014. Yeah, it could have been going on for 50 years. Yeah. You don't know. <laughs> the Doctor doesn't fin- doesn't visit the 21st century much after the Second Doctor era. At least not until the uh, not the New Doctor Who. era. <laughs> not until it becomes the 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> then all of a sudden, the 21st century just seems overly intriguing for no apparent reason. All right, so. <laughs> What I just is when everything so, changes. Yeah. So what I disliked about this episode, the serial is, why in the name of hell did they dress the sea devils up like samurai? Because it's yeah. cool. I mean, <laughs> I could see giving them some kind of weird outfit that would be more indicative of being some kind of alien race, but that was obviously samurai. Yeah, that was yeah, obviously the Earth Samurai. And the helmet with the freaking thing on it. Yes. That was like <laughs> Samurai Sea Devils. I'm like, what is this? Are they going for a new cartoon? <laughs> mm. <laughs> or immature, uh, active Samurai Slug. <laughs> yeah. It, um, and this was just, both. This was, it was just absolutely no. They just uh, put in something not British on them just to make them look different, and mm, it does not work. Yes. Yeah. Especially I mean, now, it, it might have not been as obvious in 84, 
but you know, as our as our our freaking uh, culture I, has gotten I, globalized, that kind of thing becomes really obvious to us. Actually, <laughs> I, I think I will give them that much. I think in Britain they censored a lot of stuff that we knew very popular in America when we could call it out really well and easily in America. Because you realize Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, right? <laughs> That's the kind of ridiculousness mm, that ju- that Britain would censor. So I'm not surprised. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm not surprised I threw a samurai suit on them expecting no one to realize it's a human outfit. Mm. I mean, this is the same show that did the Celestial Toy Maker. <laughs> they yeah. had the guy who played well, Alfred dress up. That was 20 years ago by this point, but yeah. In that. Well, yeah, and we had talent like more recently to this. We had talents of Wen Chiang with yellow face and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm. <laughs> well, that was also the seventies, and the Brits were having a issue mm. with Asians during the seventies, still, as I recall. But yeah, having one now too, although that was mentioned in Doctor Who as well. <laughs> It's a thing. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's just a thing that keeps happening. Same with Russia, to be honest. <laughs> but let's okay. not get into right. that, shall we? All right. So, uh, so favorite. Uh, um. Oh, well, go ahead, Thomas. I will throw in. I'm actually surprised that I didn't mention because it was going to be my go-to. The fact that the Silurians and Sea Devils call themselves the Silurians and the Sea Devils. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, nobody brought that up as their point. <laughs> I forgot about that. Well, th- yeah, they were those were human names for them, weren't they? Yep. Yeah, Oof. like they had like scientific names that they don't even say themselves. I think the doctor's just like, oh, they're this, and then like from then on, they just some guy oh. calls, oh, I've just been calling them Silurians or something, and that just sticks. Apparently um, they yeah they've just been going with those names because apparently they must have heard them and they went you know what these names sound better anyway um, <laughs> even though they started calling the sea devils sea devils like before they even woke up mm. and they even called themselves the sea devils so yeah, yeah. so it's sort of like what happened to the ice war ice warriors didn't that some rando just called them that one that sticks mm. <laughs> actually that's true of the uh, Mars warriors too isn't it. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's a, it's a bad thing when you get a a slang name for a, a species, and it just becomes what they call themselves. It's like especially the something like sea devils. It's basically if you took a, a racial slur, and you're just like, yeah, that's um, we forgot what we we're called, so we'll call ourselves that slur now. Mm-hmm. Oof. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it was less of a slur, and I believe it was originally it was supposed to be like some sort of local legend or something. But yeah, that's just that's all kinds of hmm. awkward. It's, it just kind of shows the writers didn't really pay attention. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Apparently, there was like the scripts came into the guy who had to like go through it to look for continuity errors. Came back with like a ton every time. <laughs> To the point that the writer was just like, ah, fuck it, I don't care. I don't care that they <laughs> called themselves Florians the and Seabells anymore. Asleep at the helm. Either mm-hmm. or, yeah. All right, so favorite scene, Tim. I love the scene where uh, the doctor comes across an unconscious man, steals his suit, and says, Man, what did you eat? God damn it, that was mine. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> to top it off, uh, the doctor walks away, and then we see two other people in the background go past this unconscious body without even so much as a... Uh, hey, what was that? I was like, apparently this is a common occurrence on this submarine that people don't even... <laughs> e- even give it a, a second glance. <laughs> okay, Matt... Uh, okay, favorite scene. Favorite scene. Um, let's go with non-ironic. Uh, um, I'm going to go. Oh gosh. Um. Ah, oh, dang. There's there's a couple of good ones. I'm just I'm my, I'm trying to make my brain decide on one right now. Um. 
let's go with the uh um actually yeah start of episode two uh we just see the doctor fly backwards and he seems to bob up and then slowly sink into the water again and they assume he's dead just for him to suddenly doggy paddle very easily into an airlock get saved and <laughs> you just see this poor drowned rat of david Tennant uh trying to get another airlock open <laughs> You mean Peter Davison? Or oh, Peter Davison. <laughs> I was going to say, what is David doing there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, ex- I'm big into that doctor's name. Uh, yeah, yeah, Peter Davison just trying to get the next airlock. He's just, this poor man is just apparently being doused with water between takes, I assume. <laughs> and he's got to sit around in these cold metal tunnels and messing around with these widgets and whatnot. <laughs> All right. He looks, looks very displeased. Bill, I wasn't able to come up with a full scene I would call a favorite, but there's at least a line that made me chuckle a bit. Um, and that was when um, Tegan was arguing with the doctor, and she said she, uh, you know, she doesn't like to make it a habit to run into doors that say "keep out radiation danger." And I'm like, yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, uh, Thomas. Um, I'm pretty much gonna go with like one that is so bad it's good just because I just enjoy how bad it is so much, and that is pretty much the scene that this serial is known for, where the um double agent doctor lady comes around the corner and sees the murker and is just doing like fuck knows what the hell she's doing she's trying kind to of like weaving from kick. side to side and then kicks it and then just dies and it's just somebody wasn't paying <laughs> that attention like to the notes iconically being bad. <laughs> that is like that is like the me that is like that is the antithesis of it just flips around and becomes amazing i almost kind of pictured in my head just holding up like a card or like one of those things where it's got like 10 on it <laughs> it's like a judge thing where i'm just holding up a thing with 10 on it because it's like okay <laughs> this is so, it's just it's so bad that it flips around i actually missed it because I was like not in- entirely paying attention, and then I'm right, like, oh shit, I missed it. See, that's not so the I scene I was alerted re- to as being what's popular for, but I can see where in certain circles that's mm. a good laughing point. Because, <laughs> yeah. like, I missed it when I was recording it, and then again missed it, but I was like, okay, I can actually rewind this. And I actually watched it in its full glory, and it's just like, oh god, <laughs> this is so fucking ridiculous. <laughs> All right. Uh, so shocked to death my, by the man to buy him. My favorite scene is when Tegan catches up to the doctor in the suit and then looks up at him and goes, Doctor, what have you been eating? <laughs> Just <laughs> Just look, look come on. <laughs> yeah. I just I just had to book in uh, Tim's. <laughs> All right, least favorite scene. Tim. Least favorite scene, uh the cliffhanger of uh, the very first episode, I believe, was the weakest cliffhanger I've ever seen. <laughs> it's too late, Tegan. He's drowned. What? He fell ten feet into a pool, and, and he's been there for like five, two seconds. It's like... <laughs> se- seconds. Oh, it, clearly he's a dead man. drowning never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately, once again, you stole mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm like sitting there's like what? So at worst he has a sore stomach from the belly flop he just did. <laughs> or maybe I've he bumped his head on the way down, of, but yeah. I've done worse than that off a diving board. <laughs> Come on, guys, that's not even, you know <laughs> that's that's not even a threat. It, it, it reminds me like Tegan and Turlo would start to walk away, and they hear the doctor says, oh, "I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm not quite dead. I'm getting better. <laughs> so gonna be stone dead in a moment. <laughs> I think I'll go for a walk. You're not fooling anybody. I feel I happy. Feel happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Ooh, and then someone scratched yeah, the microphone. I have to pick up um, so is that all the, uh, okay, all the good so scenes? So that bad. would be, 
Yeah, we're on bad, and it's your go, Matt. Oh, it's actually on my go. Um, oh gosh, yeah, those suits were just terrible for me. I'm trying to think of which one was the worst. As silly and as floppy as the pantomime reptile was, I will say that seeing close-ups of the Silurians and you can see their eyes blink underneath the eyes is just <laughs> a just a moment ruiner all on its own level. It's just like. Oh come on, guys! You yeah, that, couldn't that, be that, even that, semi competent. That's what you mentioned and what you disliked about the serial overall. It was the suits in general? That was one of the things I mentioned. Well, fine. Then I'm gonna go up the scene where we sunray the pantomime lizard, and you, you just see the guy wiggling as this very lumpy, mm-hmm. awkward costume slowly <laughs> has to that... fall on its side. <laughs> okay, I will go with you on yeah, that one. Yeah, that that one that mo- that <laughs> r- moment really took me out of the episode. Like, <laughs> just like mm. okay, let's poke with a stick and see if it wiggles some more. Having having flashbacks to the Web Planet School of Special Effects. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're uh... having budget issues when you are being referenced for the Web Planet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Bill, how about you? Least favorite scene? So, I'm going to go with the scene where they talk the doctor into putting Cerebro on so that he can commit a mass murder. Because everything about that sentence was wrong, not, despite the fact that that was the cause of, what, two deaths before and never got really... Wait, 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 what? wait. How, how was that committing a mass murder? Didn't they, wasn't that the point of him putting that on was so that he could like make them? No, no, no. Like, he was trying to disable the missile launch. No, yeah, he yeah was that was to disable to, the okay. missile launch. Bill, the gas was the poison gas because was already all, going through okay. the building. Okay, because yeah, the they were all slowly getting... dying before he put it on, and they're like, "Oh, you need to put it on. It's the only way." And then he put it on and took it he, off. He and the only way to stop the missiles from nuking the yeah. planet, Bill. Yeah. yeah, they were basically. He was trying to <laughs> overload and burn out the launch trigger. Yeah. Hmm. The launch trigger circuits. He was trying to basically yeah. short them out so that the missiles wouldn't launch. Hmm. The get everyone else was just dying from the gas except for the humans who kept getting fired on by the fucking Silurians yeah. and Sea Devils at the last second. That's why the commander hmm. died is that the, the one Silurian got up and shot him with the ray the, before Turlo hmm, grabbed okay. him and gunned him down. Then I'll move a few minutes earlier to the Silurian leader insisting that it's better for him to be gassed and killed rather than for him to listen to the doctor for five minutes. That is extremely stupid. That was, he, yeah. And he, that, of all that, people, I, should know okay, better. Okay, we'll take that. Yeah, that, that's a good one. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done listening to you. I'm just going to let you kill me now. Right. Fuck, fuck mm. you, doctor. Kill, yeah. Kill me and all of my people. That's how I'll win. <laughs> that's, that's called winning, right? In reverse world, maybe. <laughs> All right, Thomas. Um, I was very tempted to go with like the very end of episode, but instead I'm going to go with the Merka breaking through the very obviously like, <laughs> Easy. like not even sure what it's made of door, where it's like basically foam. Breaking fork wood door. <laughs> yeah, and then like to add on to that, the fact that Tegan's leg gets like trapped under it, and it's like, oh no, the very I'm obvious captured. foam door. <laughs> I'm captured by styrofoam. What's it even styrofoam? I it seemed move, like very. Doctor. It seemed like very flexible, thin <laughs> rubber. Oh yeah, that was bad. Mm-hmm. Especially, especially uh, when you got the two guys under right down on either side of Tegan constantly making it wobble. <laughs> and of course, See, now yeah, the, like, the way the you described that, I'm having flashbacks to the guy that had to pull the inflatable chair over himself to be eaten by it. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, the, the falling portions of the bridge of the Reliant from Star Trek II was more realistic. <laughs> and we watched it. We watched this thing and Ricardo Maltabon just picked up and tossed one of those. <laughs> well, to be fair, in in continuity, he had cybernetics or something. But yeah. No, no, he was genetically augmented. Oh, genetically yeah. augmented. That's right. He's his super soldier. Never mind. He was basically yeah. Captain America, except evil. Yeah. I said mm. super soldier. Still. 
Red Skull, maybe. That's that was, I think, the first case that we'd actually ever seen of them being that strong. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. but still, that the the falling bridge pieces were more authentic looking <laughs> than <laughs> the piece of freaking door. That bloody white rubber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that looked like styrofoam. It looked like it was. Styrofoam. I, I, I think. It, I think what it was is they were doing multiple different things, so it might have been like white rubber with a styrofoam backing mm. originally, in order to try yeah. and make it feel more stable when it fell over. Help me, help me, doctor! A cooler lid fell on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. a, a cooler lid is uh. more stable than that thing was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. Tim took my least favorite scene and my reason for taking it too. So give me a moment. I think my least favorite scene is just the end where you just realize that everybody's dead and you're just like, well, <laughs> yeah. that was pointless. Mm. Well, welcome <laughs> to the episode where everyone dies. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. I look, like Who. when it, when it like ended on that, I'm like, wait, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's there's, it. Everybody's there should have been another way at the end. At that point, <laughs> point freaking Holly should have come up on the screen. It's like, everyone's dead, Doctor. Everybody? Yeah. I, I could be wrong, and this could be, a jerk. this could be a jerk she made about something else, but I remember watching a, like a Diamond Hagen thing, and she makes the jerk of, like, just this once, everybody dies! <laughs> I'd be surprised if it would have been this one. Yeah, it's it's pretty freaking bad when you know, you know, you figure a sea base like that has to have two to three hundred personnel. And they've been all wiped up between the sea devils, the sea devil monster, the Silurians, and the backstabbers. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's just like God. What was the point? And At this point, guys. I I could have I could have just blown up the base, and escaped in the TARDIS. And I would have had the same body count and less work. Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So final thoughts. Tim. Final thoughts. Uh, we are thought running the doc- late, though. So make the, it the, doc- nice. the doctor was okay. Uh, this episode uh, was kind of heavy-handed in its uh, not-too-subtle symbolism. Symbolism. Uh, but, uh, the Sea Devils and Zillurans were okay, and I had no problem with the Electro Sea Seahorse. <laughs> but, uh, again, it was, uh, it was a bit grimdark, especially for someone of my sensibilities. And, uh, but, uh, Peter Davison was cool. I mean, that's what I have to say. You know, that creature reminded me of something. But I think it was from a Roger Corman film. Won't be surprised. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I think it was still better in the in the frickin' Corman. Mm-hmm. All right, Matt. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. The some of the ideas in this plot are not bad. It's the costuming's fault for ruining like plot A. Plot B was good until it got into involved into plot A and then just went completely crazy and off the rails. Um, uh, a lot of this is just like bad presentation, bad and uh, bad thoughts on set to try and make up for things that they, uh, I assume they apparently couldn't get done right. Uh-huh. Um, and... Yeah, I thought that uh, everything in this for costumes were borrowed, but to see that they actually were remodeling some of these monsters just makes it even sadder, the fact that they were actually worse than the originals. Um, I could definitely see why they needed to update and remodel a lot of creatures. Uh, and to be honest, this also does suffer a lot from the British 80s grimdark sci-fi which hey, well, I, 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 I will say it was very popular at the time, and I'm sure it has its time and place, but uh, was not necessarily was, Doctor Who. It wasn't as dystopian as other entries into this, but it was grimdark. It was, it was, yeah, it was definitely not the darkest story of the Sayward era, but it, it was, still it's up there, though. typifies its era. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So, Bill, how about you? 
there's a lot of stuff we never mentioned, such as the ridiculous red, white, and blue uniforms or Turlo <laughs> and the Doctor. I, I kept wanting to bring those up. Some people and just go away with it afterward. Um, so, yeah, this episode knocked us, and I don't know, not a good for it. It's um, examples of bringing a monster back and not having the budget or the I don't know, the right idea to do it well. Um, and it kind of ends up just being a rehash plus the grim darkness. And yeah, it doesn't end very well at all. And they have to just... All right. I all right. think we got a good, we got a little bit, but we got most of that, even though you went a little robotic at the beginning and end. Oh, all right. Well, the three of you now. All the more reason. <laughs> um, the three of you start thinking of your scores. Thomas? Um, this is like, I'll put it this way. It's, I find it funny that the less episodes a Silurian based ish story has, the worse it is. Because arguably the Silurians is the best in that seven parts. Sea Devils is not as bad as this. And it's six, and this is four parts, and it's arguably the worst of three. And which I guess to give it something, I'm glad that this, I'm almost glad that this is not six parts. I mean, some things probably could have been fleshed out a bit more if it was, but at the same time, as kind of dull as this can be. <clears throat> This would probably be a similar problem that I would like I had to the web planet. So at least this isn't as long as that. <laughs> <coughs> um, but just yeah, the the crappy by even Doctor Who standards, like redo of the Silurian suits are just kind of crap. The Sea Devils outside of the samurai stuff are basically the same, so it's like eh. Um, the Merker is just, I, I don't even know what, it's like someone was just trying to outdo Malcolm Hulk with that. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I would basically say that you could just skip this, like just, just watch the Sea Devils and the Silurians and just not watch this at all. You don't really have to. So like, if you want some, if you like, just, just watch the scene where the woman tries to karate kick a freaking murker and that's <laughs> that's all you need <laughs> really um so yeah all right so this up this serial is something that probably sounded good at the concept table mm -hmm. when it was pitched but the execution of it just completely and totally failed mostly because they didn't have the budget to pull it off um, the story is a little convoluted, but not too bad compared to other stuff. Uh, however, the out the costuming is atrocious, pretty much all around. The, the new Silurian outfits are worse than the originals. The Sea Devils are basically just rehashed, but those uh, those particular costumes didn't age well. Um, mm. the uh. The outfits are completely the uh, the humans' outfits are completely inappropriate for an undersea base. You know, if they had, if they had recolored mm -hmm. and redressed wetsuits, mm. it would have looked better. Yeah, instead of giving them thriller outfits. Correct. <laughs> and if you're going to have your your outfits in different colors, make sure they're different colors for a reason. Star Trek did this mm. right, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. They had one color for command, one color for science, one color for engineering and security. They figured it out. They always made sure that someone was wearing the right color suit. Here, it just seemed to be random. Here, here, take this suit, take this suit, take this suit. And you don't do it that way. You need mm -hmm. to know what, you know, your designation is. <sighs> oh, well. So, yeah, the freaking monster was terrible bad. Um, <laughs> and it is, this does suffer from being the worst body count 
one of the worst body counts in Doctor Who, and that includes Dalek episodes. Which at this mm. point, you're just like, oh, what is the point anymore? The Doctor didn't mm. save anybody. Well, technically he stopped the human race from being annihilated, but nobody's there to notice it. Because they're <laughs> all fucking dead. Yeah. Not seeing mm. a sequel off of this one, are we? <laughs> yeah. Suddenly I'm getting the South Park CEO. Yeah. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> All right. The sequel is Tegan goes for therapy. <laughs> All right, people, let's let's go for rating. Yeah, Tegan needs a crap load of therapy after this season. All right, <laughs> let's go to ratings. Tim. Uh, this just averages out a, once again to a 3.0. You're you're uh, generous on those averages. That's about as low as you rate anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's coming! It's coming! All right, um, <laughs> Matt. Uh, last time averaged uh, three point oh. I say this is below that one, so this is a two point five. Five, Bill. I'm thinking a two point oh. Two point zero from Bill, Thomas. Yep. Uh, see, I was almost going to rate this higher than the web planet by virtue of it being shorter. <laughs> but, I mean, the web planet, the actors in it actually like it. No one on involved in this story defends it. So, yeah, this is just going to get it too. <laughs> Which is exactly what you rated the web planet. Yeah. Uh, so, like, I, it brings it down from being higher to just equal to. <laughs> I give. I agree with Bill and Thomas. This is a 2.0 episode. Oof. So, regardless of Tim's overly uh, generous, <laughs> that and Matt's <laughs> slightly generous, that uh, this averages out to a 2.3. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same as the Web Planet. <laughs> it is the exact same as the Web Planet. This is now uh, 2.99 out of 302. It is on par with the web planet. Uh, is it on par with any others? Uh, yeah, with uh, the wedding of River Song. <laughs> oh my God! Oof. <laughs> <laughs> it is better than the two doctors, and is worse than a Christmas Carol. Oh my God! Let's kill Hitler. <laughs> oh my God! Listen. <laughs> Um, the impossible astronaut, day of the moon, the king's demons, and time flight. This is worse than time flight. Yes, but not time flash. <coughs> oh, it's I, it's worse than time flash. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. I was a little generous with time flash because you know, what's his name <sighs> was in there? The guy that played Avon. Oh right, the guy, that, mm -hmm. the guy that died recently. Yeah. All right, so there we go. We will say two eighty six out of three hundred two. That's all we have to say about Warriors of the Deep. Yeah. Right. Uh, don't forget to comment below. Let us know what you think and which of our scores you agree with, or if you disagree with all of us. If you give it a one or a four. I don't know why you would give it a four, but maybe you. I don't even know how to follow that sentence just, up. But yeah. Maybe you just something. <laughs> maybe you're more Tim than Tim. <laughs> maybe you're you highly it, more forgiving. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube or follow on Twitch or both. All right. So next week, the badness continues as we jump from Peter's final season to Sylvester McCoy's first. Not that Colin Baker doesn't have bad episodes, but we've reviewed them already. Get your 50s groove on. Put on your poodle skirt. It's time for Delta and the Bannerman. Written by Malcolm Cole and starring Sylvester McCoy as the Doctor and Bonnie Langford as Mel. Oh, boy. <laughs> See you all next week. Yeah. Subscribe. Resubscribe. Novarcast smells of cabbage. <laughs>